to the Good Christophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. For this week, we're listening to a talk that was given by Brother John Thomas Perks from the Ontario, Canada Ecclesia. Uh, This was an exhortation he gave at the Guyana Ecclesia in South America, Uh, and he is taking a look at the struggle that we all face going between what we know that God wants us to do and the pull and the the distraction of the world. Uh, And specifically, he's looking at the example of Samson. Uh, and has some interesting insights on the character of Samson and the struggle that he felt throughout his life, uh, living as a Nazarite and as a judge, um, but also the way he interacted with the Philistines. Uh, or really interesting exhortation. Um, there are a few spots where, uh, I'm assuming this was done over by Zoom or another video conferencing uh, tool, there's a, but there's a few spots where you can tell uh, Brother John's connection breaks up a little bit, so there's a few spots where um, he sort of cuts off mid-statement and then comes back not bad enough to lose track of the of the talk. It happens at uh, opportune moments, but um, overall was uh, a really good exhortation, a good reminder of the struggle that we all face with the temptation of the world and the pull of those in the world to conform to what the world thinks is right versus what God thinks is right. So, um, really enjoyed the exhortation. It was uh, a recommendation that a sister down in Guyana sent our way, um, and I'm glad she did. It's a, an excellent one and a good reminder, um, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now, and everyone thinks they have the, the best solution, uh, and they want you to be on board with it and to convince you of that. Uh, it's a good reminder that the plan and what we're standing for is different than what the world has to offer and is better than anything the world could offer to us. So, uh, again, uh, thank you to the sister who sent this exhortation in, and thank you all for listening. If you have recommendations, please send them in. We we can always use them, and they're always appreciated. Uh, With that, we will turn it over to our brother John Thomas Perks for his exhortation on Samson and choosing God over the world. This morning... I want to talk about a battle, and it's a battle that I believe at one time or another in all Christadelphian lives, we've, we've had to fight. When I was a teenager, I, I would say I almost lost this battle that we're going to talk about this morning. Um, and I, w- I would say that the enemy still pokes his head over the distant hills once in a while. Um, to see if my defenses are down. Um, At times in our lives, it may be a raging battle, one that we might even be losing. And at times, we might enjoy times of peace. And this battle, I think, is really clear. It comes out very clearly in our reading from Thursday in Ezekiel. So if you could just turn real quickly to Ezekiel chapter 20. And just a a marvelous chapter, um, a sad chapter, but it just paints everything so clearly. Um, Ezekiel chapter 20, and just read with me verse 5 and 6. It says, Say to them, thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob, and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day, I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. So here God is he's raising his hand in an oath. And he's saying, I chose you. And not only did I choose you as my special people, he went out and searched for a land, the glory, the glory of lands that was flowing with milk and honey. And he said, I I raised my hand that I would bring you into that land. 
They were his people, and he was their God. You know what a tremendous thing. This is the creator of all things saying, I picked you. It was a great calling, and it had tremendous benefit. And it had very serious responsibilities. They were to devote themselves fully to God. No more idols, no more idols of Egypt, no more idols of the lands around them. They were to live lives of purpose, God's purpose. And what was their response? If you jump over chapter 20, verse 32, look at their response to this. And God says, what you have in your mind shall never be when you say we will be like the Gentiles like the families in other countries serving wood and stone. That was their response to this wonderful calling of God. It was, we don't want to be special. We don't want to be different. They were saying, we don't want your ways. In fact, when you get right down to it, they were saying to their heavenly father, we don't want you. That's a, that's astounding. Um, But it's not such a foreign concept. This isn't something that was just written a long time ago. You know, these things were written for our learning, for our instruction. And so we might look at our lives and say, you know what, I was I was born into a Christadelphian family. I was raised with those beliefs. I was taught the gospel. Um, And you may be in the same situation. You've always been raised with this, or you may have been taught the truth. And now you are, you know, God has still picked you. You've been chosen by God. And yet there's this relentless pressure from the world. Uh, The world is constantly saying to us, conform, be like us, choose our ways, not God's. And ultimately, at some point in our lives, while that battle might be going on, and as I mentioned, sometimes it might be raging, sometimes it might be at peace, we have to decide, do I want to be God's or do I want to be the world's? And sometimes people come right out and say it like they did in Ezekiel. They say, I don't want God and I don't want his ways. And sometimes people don't say that with words but our actions speak loud and clear. And I was thinking of Malachi. We don't have to turn there, but in Malachi, you know, God confronts the people, and and they're shocked. They, They say, in what ways have we defiled your name? And he says, you know, by offering blind and lame uh, in the offerings. So by their actions, they were saying, we don't want you, God. Now, I want to examine this battle, this battle of You know, God has chosen us, and he's given us tremendous blessings. And yet, sometimes, we say, I don't. So, chapter 13, just to to set the context. Judges chapter 13. And in the first five verses, we read about Samson's uh, parents. And here it says, Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. And there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver. So the wife of Manoah has to commit to a certain lifestyle, not only for herself, but for her son, as we read in those verses. Samson was chosen, and he was chosen to be separate. He was to be in, you know, verses 3 and 4, it says, From the seed 
to the skin of the grape. They were to have none of it. Um, that was rule number one. Rule number two was no cutting of your hair. And rule number three, that they were never to touch anything, any dead bodies. Now, keep this in mind. Um, this is the life that was chosen for Samson. Um, it, was a, it was an understanding that was struck between this angel uh, and Samson's mom. Samson had no say in the deal. This is the life that was chosen for him. And there was tremendous blessings. You know, I think every young Christadelphian boy, when they read the stories of Samson, pictured themselves with enormous strength and being able to do tremendous things. I mean, this is a superhero in real life. So tremendous blessings, that power that he had. Um, but there was tremendous responsibilities. He was to be separated to God. He was to serve his heavenly father. And so what we see is mixed with these exploits where he went against the Philistines is this dangerous game where he's flirting with the ways of the Philistines. And, and we have to ask, what's going on here? You know, this is a man who's been chosen by God and he has all this power and he has all these blessings and yet he's flirting with the Philistines and, and accepting some, you know, sort of enticed by their ways and getting closer and closer to them uh, in his life. And so as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, what was, what was Samson's greatest challenge in his life? Um, was it motivation? You know, it seems like the only time he really struck the Philistines was when he had been um, insulted or when he had been offended or when he had been provoked. And then he would go out and he would he would go after the Philistines. Uh, so was it motivation? Or was his big challenge the actual battles with the Philistines? Was that his biggest challenge? Or was it the third option, which I think is, is the, the one that I've settled on? I think Samson's biggest challenge was his internal struggle. I think he was saying, is this really what I want? Do I want what my family has chosen for me? Do I want their beliefs? Do I want this calling to be a Nazarite? Do I want to be different? Do I want all these rules in my life? Or do I want this lifestyle I see around me? Um, this freedom that the people around me seem to have. And so there was this... In enticement to those ways and I think that's a familiar struggle that's the battle I was talking about at the beginning that we all have to fight at some time in our lives is this really what I want um, or is the world what I want now I'm convinced that Samson went back and forth on this his parents like our parents would have taught him about God they would have taught him about his ways. They would have talked about this angel coming and speaking to them. They would have talked about their hope. And he would have seen in his own life the power of God. He would have been shown the benefits and the honor uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the privileges of being chosen by God. And then there would be this temptation of leaving it all behind and just breaking it loose and being like everybody else. And that's what the, the people in Ezekiel said. We will be like the Gentiles. We'll serve stone and wood. And God was saying, no, you're not going to. But that was their heart. We just want to be like everyone else. So let's see, is this true of Samson's life? If we can know that he definitely didn't seem to be excited about being a Nazarite. When you, if you ever get a chance and you do a comparison between Samuel and Samson, you know, vastly different lives, both from mothers who couldn't have children, both promised to have a son. Samuel's whole life is dedicated to God. You never see him wavering. You never see him thinking, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I'd like to marry a Philistine woman. Like his, his course is straight and it's always towards God. And Samson is just all over the place. So let's look and, and Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. 
It says he's attracted to a Philistine girl. It says, now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. And despite his parents' protests, he's determined. No, no, this is, she makes me happy. This is the girl I want. In chapter 14, verse 5, it says, So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, at some point here, it seems like his parents, he got away from his parents a little bit. And he goes into a vineyard, and this is where he kills this young lion, and then he doesn't tell his parents. Uh, and the reason he doesn't tell his parents, because the first thing his parents are going to say is, what were you doing in a vineyard? You know, why would he go to a place of great temptation? If he's not supposed to touch from seed to skin, he's not supposed to eat or drink from seed to skin, what is he doing in a vineyard? And I think this is the beginning of that game where he's that temptation is there. Um, in chapter 14, verse 10, it says, So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there for the young for young men used to do so. So here he is, he's partying with the Philistines. In Judges 16, which we read this morning, you know, he's with a harlot from Gaza. You know, this is not the life that Samuel lived. Uh we see this, this enticement to the world's ways uh, in Samson. And in Judges chapter 16, which we had read for us, this is, this is a troubling uh, chapter. How could Samson, and I've always wondered this, and, and I'm sure many of us have, how could Samson have been so foolish to let this happen? So like in verse 7... You know, Delilah's pestering him. And he says, well, you know, if you tie me up with seven fresh bowstrings, you know, then then I'll become like other men. And he wakes up in the morning and he's tied up with seven fresh bowstrings. Okay, coincidence? Uh, and then in verse 11, you know, she pesters him again. Verse 11, he says, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used... And he wakes up in the morning and he's tied up with new ropes that have never been used. And I, I, I'm sure he's beginning to see a pattern. And then she pesters him again. Oh, well, if you weave, he tells her, if you weave my hair, uh, seven locks of my hair into a loom, then I lose my power. And he wakes up and it's happened again. It's happened again. Didn't he know what was going to happen when he told her the truth? Um, and I don't think, I think he knew what was going on. He, I think he knew, and every time he's getting a little bit closer to the fact it's his hair, I think he's in this, he's, he's a willing participant in this game where he is toying yeah. with being just like everyone else and giving up like they did in Ezekiel. We just want to be like the Gentiles. He's flirting with the idea of not being sanctified uh, and being just like everyone else. Maybe he was enticed by the idea, idea of no more responsibilities and no more pressure. Um, and can you hear him saying to his parents, I didn't choose this. I didn't choose to be a Nazarite. You did. Right? Something we may have heard from our young people or ourselves at some point in time. And I think there's there's three universal dangerous things that are happening here in his battle for faith. And the first one is in verse 16. It says, and it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words. She pestered him daily. That is our world. Our world through social media and billboards and TV and radio pesters us 24-7. Be like us. Follow our ways. Think like we do. It's relentless. And she was relentless. It says he was vexed to death. And then the second thing, the second universal um, dangerous element is in verse 19. It says, then she lulled him to sleep. And isn't that our world? We, we want to be diligent and vibrant and passionate for our God and our world our world just lulls us to sleep 
it makes our it makes our spiritual senses dull. And the third thing that was dangerous, and I think it's universal, we have to be aware of it, is that his heart wasn't anchored. He was back and forth. He was he was passionate for God, and then he was passionate for Philistine ways. And what does it say over and over? One of the great Bible um, study tools that I was taught was look for repeating words. Look for repeating um, phrases. And in this chapter, there's a phrase that comes up a number of times. And it's at the end of verse 7, it says, when he's explaining about the how he will lose his power, he says, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. And it comes up in verse 7. It comes up in verse 11, and it comes up in verse 17. And literally, in, in the Hebrew, it means, um, I'll be as one of men, or I'll be like mankind, or I won't be different from other men. You know, I'll be like other men. When you do this, I'll be like other men. And how is he saying it? Is he saying it with a little you know, sparkle in his eye, a little hope? You know, wouldn't it be great to just be like other men? As they said in Ezekiel, we just want to be like the Gentiles. And in verse 17, it says, he told her all his heart. You know, what did that involve? Did it involve his frustrations, his struggles with being a Nazarite, the expectations? Um, but in the end, what he did was he had, chosen the world and what was the result and I think this is something we all have to do if we're in this battle we have to think beyond the the battle right now and say okay what are the consequences of this decision and look at verse 20 here's the consequences it says and she said to the Philistines the Philistines are upon you Samson so he awoke from his sleep and said I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him and I have a little footnote it's my own footnote and I put it in there and I put in um, he got what he wished he became like every other man and so what's what's the lesson you know in Ezekiel and in and with Samson God had hand picked them they were they were special in his eyes we have been handpicked by our heavenly father we have enormous blessings and we have enormous responsibilities in first peter chapter 2 verses 9 through 10 if I, we could just read that first peter chapter 2 like think about how we've been chosen by God. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. What an awesome hope we have. You know, we've been called to be separate, to have an active conscience. And yes, there are responsibilities, but it gives us a purpose to this life. And it gives us a purpose beyond this life. And we can have all that, or we can be like every other man. Samson thought he was freeing himself. He thought he was going to be free. But look at what happened. And we go back in, in verse 21 of Judges 16. And this is so true. This is the freedom of the world. If we choose to be like every other man, here's what we get. He becomes, verse 21, it says, the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. That's the first thing. We become blind. The people in this world are blind. They have no vision. They're groping through life day to day with no hope. What else happens? They took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters. He becomes a slave. He thought he was getting freedom. He became a slave. And people are slaves to sin, and they don't even know it. 
He became destined to death. And what was what was his job now? They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prisons. And I've seen pictures where, you know, he's pushing this this millstone, and he's pushing this bar around and around and around. And isn't that life without a hope? We just go around and around and around in circles until we die. And that's what he chose. And that's the, the only other choice other than the blessings of God is a life of slavery, of blindness, going around and around in circles until we die. That's what being like any other man will ultimately get you. Why would we ever choose that over the gift of God? Let's just go to a couple passages just to remind us of what we've been chosen to be a part of. Can we go to Ephesians, please? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. It says... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then just look at verses 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, and even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, By grace, you have been saved. Think about those blessings. Adoption is sons, heirs to the kingdom of God. The choice should be so clear. And it's ironic that when Samson was strong and he had his sight, he couldn't see the truth. And yet when he was blinded and when he was weak, he was finally able to see the value of what he had been given. There are many many people who have chosen the path that Samson was choosing. And I don't want to say that Samson won't be in the kingdom, that the end of his life, um, when he turned to God, uh, may speak very loudly. But there are people that choose to walk away from the promises of God and become like every other man. There are way too many people right at the finish line who are so distracted by the temporary that they're losing sight of the eternal. So may we never choose to be like every other man. And as we turn our attention to the bread and the wine, to the Son of Man, who from a very early age knew that he was to be about his father's business. It was a calling that would have a tremendous cost. He would go through tremendous suffering. And he would have tremendous temptations, but he never wavered. And yet he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so as you partake of the bread and the wine, you know, appreciate that we've been called, that we've been separated, that we have this hope and these blessings, that we've been called to be, by our God, to be a part of his family. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks. 
or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.